Good morning and welcome everyone to this seminar. I'm just going to look for a quick um, nod from some of my colleagues that they can hear me. Um, yep, brilliant. So I'm really delighted to have um, you joining us today to talk about the public sector equality duty in England in the light of COVID-19. First thing I just want to say to let you know that we are recording this event and that's with a view to making it available afterwards and um, both yourselves um, for your reflections and we may also um, be putting this on YouTube if we can. You should be able to see me and you'll see the other presenters in due course. Um, we can't see, we can neither see nor hear you, um, but it is fantastic um, to know that we are due to have um, over 250 people joining us from across local government, from health, from education, from not-for-profit organisations, regulatory and central government, and that's just fantastic. So I'm Kath Denham, I am the Director of Corporate Services and England for the Equality and Human Rights Commission. And this session is part of our um, activity within the England network. Obviously, the EHRC covers the whole of the UK, um, but this event is for our England network. And through our work with England, and we're really seeking to develop a strategy for um, this nation, is we're seeking to increase and improve the engagement that we have, particularly with local and regional partners throughout England. This is the first um, of these webinars that we're hosting as part of that activity. We very much hope it goes well, but bear with us. We haven't done one of these quite this way before. But of course, we're all using webinar um, at the moment, and I think it's a really important and useful tool, and I hope that we get a lot out of this. But of course, the last six months have been truly unprecedented for every single person um, in this country and indeed across the world. And I know that the vast majority, vast, vast majority of people who work in the public service, um, and I worked myself in health for over 20 years in Scotland before joining EHRC just in June this year, we work in public service, and I mean that very broadly, um, because we want to make good decisions in the interests of all the people that we serve. And the harms that COVID-19 has caused are, of course, being felt by everybody to some extent, but they are not being felt equally. Um, and also what COVID has done, of course, is it exposed the fact that um, many of the adverse impacts of what happens in society were already not being felt equally. So how we respond to COVID-19 has to seek to deal proactively with the unequal impacts so that the most vulnerable people and the most exposed to this virus are supported. We all know that that's not easy. Um, both within the pressures of needing to make very rapid decisions in the here and now, and also in the wider context of thinking ahead to how we build that better. But then that's the reason that we're here today is precisely because it is both difficult, but also essential to ensure that the most vulnerable in our society are not looked over. And the reason we're here is because the PSED, the Public Sector Equality Duty, can help us to do that if we apply it well. So we're here for the next um, hour and a bit to learn from each other on how to meet these challenges. You're going to be hearing from two colleagues from our own compliance team at EHRC. We're also going to be hearing from a regulatory body, the Quality Care Commission, and from a county council, Devon County Council, about the steps that they have taken to respond and meet and think about the needs of um, those that need or come under the protection of the PSAD in the light of this response. But we're obviously also here to learn from you by the questions that you ask us and the feedback that you give us on what you've done and what also what you need from us by way of support. So the way it's going to run is we're going to hear from each of the speakers in turn. We're just going to go straight from speaker to speaker. And then we will have, I hope, time for a short Q&A at the end. You do have a bar at the side of your screen, I hope, that um, is a Q&A bar. And please pose questions there at any time. Um, or you can wait until we get into the Q&A in the last 20 minutes. We'll answer as many of the questions that we can during that time. But we will also be happy to respond to questions that you have that we don't have time on the day. You will have a contact through Shan Lambert, and please use that to um, give us more feedback or ask further questions afterwards. So I hope you're looking forward to the range of speakers that we have as much as I am. 
But with that, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, who is Claire Lesko. Claire is Senior Associate um, with the Equality and Human Rights Commission, and she's going to talk for the next 15 minutes or so um, about the key principles behind, in, behind assessing the impact for people protected by the public sector equality duty. So I'll hand over to Claire. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm just going to share my presentation with you now. Here we go. Hopefully it works. Can you see my presentation, everyone? Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. So I've been asked today to present the key principle and the value and importance of the PSED and especially the general duty, uh, which uh, relates to assessing the quality impact of your decision and policy. So that's what I'm going to focus on. And Perhaps some of you already know about the PSED general duty on how to assess your equality impact, but we thought it would be great to go back to, to basic because in this context of, of COVID, this is a tool, as, as Kat said, that could really help you uh, making decisions um, that are fair, transparent and accountable um, quickly and efficiently. So I'm going to focus first on the value and importance of assessing equality impact, and then I'm going to tell you um, practical ways on, on how, uh, in relation to how to conduct an equality impact assessment to meet the requirement of the Equality Act 2010. Lucy from the CQC and Joe from Devon County Council will present the work they've done in practical ways in relation to assessing equality impact uh, in the context of COVID. So I'm present, presenting more the theoretical bit and they're presenting more the practical bit. Um, I'm going on the first line. There you go. So this is just uh, providing you an overview of what the PSED um, general duty is. And it's the same across Great Britain, so England, Scotland, and Wales. Um, it's set up in primary legislation, so it's not it's not a nice thing to do. It's a legal requirement and it's not new actually. So uh, we hope that some of you will be familiar um, with it and already um, complying with it. Um, so what does it require? The PSED general duty requires public authority, but also organization delivering public function to assess the impact of the decision and policy on people with protected characteristic. And I will tell you a bit more about that in a second. And in relation to three aim, in relation to the need to eliminate unlawful discrimination, harassment and victimization, in relation to advancing equality of opportunity between different groups, and here you should make the link with another duty in the Equality Act, which is to make reasonable adjustment for people with disability. And the third is to foster good relation between different groups. So if you look at it, the PSED general duty provides you with a framework to think about um, ways that you can um, proactively tackle institutional discrimination, but also crucially mainstream equality in everything you do. So that's taking decision, policy development, budget setting, procurement, service delivery, and employment function. I was just talking to you about protected characteristic, and I think most of you will be familiar with, with this, but I think it's important to just list them um, as they currently are uh, in the Equality Act, and things can evolve. Um, some country indeed have more protected characteristic than, than Great Britain at the moment. So at the moment, in Great Britain, the characteristic protected under the Equality Act are age, disability, and that includes physical and mental impairment, including learning disability and autism, for example, gender reassignment, pregnancy and maternity, race, and again, including colour, nationality, ethnic or national origin, religion or belief, sex or gender, sexual orientation. And I put marriage and civil partnership in Italy there because it relates only to employment function, not really services uh, type functions, and it relates only to eliminating discrimination. So it's not particularly relevant in the context of COVID as such, um, and thinking about policy and decision relevant to service users, but bear in mind that it's covered for employment. Next slide. Um, this is about the scope and purpose of the general equality duty, which is all about assessing equality impact in effect. So I want to insist first on the coverage or the scope of it. Um, I already said 
public authority are covered, but also organization delivering public function. And that's really important to understand because if you um, public authority, I'm going to say, let's say a local authority are commissioning out a private organization to, let's say, uh, run a care home on your behalf. At the end of the day, you, the local authority, will still be uh, liable to ensure that this private sector company you contracted out comply with the general equality duty and assess the decision and policy for the equality impact properly. So that's really important to understand. The buck stop with public authority will um, delegate the responsibility. The other thing I wanted to uh, insist on is it's not only a legal requirement um, to assess equality impact and comply with the PSED. Um, it's an opportunity uh, for, for you to make decision based on evidence, robust evidence in a fair, transparent and accountable way, considering the needs of your community and their rights as well. So that's really important to bear in mind to set up the, the context. Um, quickly, I'm going to run through the benefits of assessing impact, and I'm going to insist on the first bullet point, especially because it's really, really relevant to COVID. It will enable you to, you know, assessing the equality impact of um, your policies and decision will enable you to make better decision making, and that includes cumulative impact. And I'm talking, I want to insist on the point on cumulative impact because we know um, that different policy and decision have been made in the context of COVID in a sort of emergency context. And if you look at individual policy, you may see a moderate um, impact on service users, but altogether, <coughs> the impact might be a lot greater. So, for instance, uh, we know, we all know that there have been um, decision and, and policies in relation to people in care homes. There have been first a blanket policy um, to put do not resuscitate on um, people in, in care home records. There have been a policy to restrict or stop all family visits. There have been a policy not to test people going in and out of care home for COVID. And there have been a policy to restrict access to health care. Those four policies altogether, um, we, I, I, I think we've got increasing evidence to show that they had together quite a devastating impact on all the people in care home. So if you guys have example on how you worked with other organizations um, to, to, to assess the impact of your different policies together on all the people, people from ethnic minority, et cetera, we would like to hear from you. Because um, this is really, really important. I'm not going to run through the other benefits because they're quite obvious and we don't have a lot of time. But I would say that complying with the PSED and I think seeing the equality impact of your policy and decision will make your organization better. You will use your resources more efficiently uh, <coughs> and you will respond to the need of your service users better. Um, and crucially, you will avoid. Um, potential for discriminatory practice and um, reduce your risk of uh, claim and other enforcement action, which I think is, again, quite relevant in the current context. Now, I'm just going to go through um, how to do a proper equality impact assessment. And the first things that I want to say is what and how to assess. First things to note is there is no one way to do this. There is no template. You are free to decide to to, to do what, what you want to assess the equality impact of your policy and decision. A lot of organizations have developed a template and there is nothing wrong about that, but it's not a requirement. Now, a um, couple of things. Some organizations, like the CQC, and we hear from Lucy later on, have extended the impact assessment process to include human rights. And I think it would make a lot of sense in the context of COVID. So bear that in mind. Uh, there are some human rights most relevant to others in the context of COVID, and I think Lucy will talk about, about this a bit more. Um, for those who are covered by the health inequality duties, uh, health bodies, um, you also have to sort of think about the impact of your decision and policy on different socioeconomic um, group. And so I think it would make sense to have a joint approach um, to assess the equality impact of your decision and policy on people with protected characteristics under the Equality Act, but also on socioeconomic background. Um, and the last thing to say is 
I think Kat's talk about the here and now and the future and the assessment of your decision and policy should be relevant to your actual staff and service users, but also your potential uh, staff and service users. You need to look um, into the future as well as the here and now. Um, now, in terms of how to do a proper um, equality impact assessment, the Brown case, which is a case um, in 2008, it was Brown against the Secretary of State for Work and Pension, provide us with criteria and principle to assess the quality of an impact assessment. And that's what I'm gonna go, th go through with you now. So the first, I've got two slides on this. The first one is about what's the basic principle of assessing. So first things to say is considering the quality impact of your policy should be part and parcel of your day-to-day -day business. In other words, every time you review your existing policy or you want to introduce your one, you should think about, mm, is this decision of policy uh, relevant to equality and the protected characteristic under the Equality Act? If yes, then second bullet point, you should be considering the equality impact and this should be an integral part of your decision-making process. So you should consider equality as a formative stage in the policy cycle before any decision is taken. And that's really important that before any decision is taken. Um, your equality impact should be considered in substance. That means alongside other type of consideration. Some of you will do financial assessment, environmental assessment. So equality ass assessment is part of, of, of that. And it should be done with an open mind, uh, which means that your equality consideration can and should influence the decision-making process um, prior, during, and after the decision is taken. So, in effect, it should lead to you deciding to review, adapt, or stop a policy if you think um, it's going to lead to discrimination. And that's, again, really important to understand. We are aware that some organizations are doing equality, equality impact assessment after taking decision, and that's a big no-no. It should be done far um, before even considering a decision or a policy. It should be a conscious process that cannot be delegated. And I talked about a sort of macro level, i.e. if you're a public authority and you decide to contract out um, a, one of your functions to uh, a third set organization, you still be liable to ensure um, this organization is complying with the PSED and assessing equality impact properly. But at a micro level, it's also important to understand that if you, uh, as a policy officer, are in charge of uh, conducting equality impact assessment, the people in your organization liable to ensure it's been done properly are your leaders and decision makers. So the buck uh, stop with public authority and the buck um, stop with your leaders and decision makers. And that's really important for them to understand, I think. Finally, the effort and resource required to assess um, equality impact should be proportionate. It's not a difficult concept in the sense that um, your policies, which are likely uh, to have a greater impact, should be given closer scrutiny. However, I want to make a point of saying that proportionality is not just about numbers. Uh, if you think in risk assessment type um, thinking, a sort of moderate impact on a lot of people is equally important to really significant impact on a small number of people. And if you think about a lot of the protected characteristic under the Equality Act, a lot of them are about minorities. I'm thinking gypsy and traveler. I'm thinking transgender people or people already. The scrutiny of your policy should be on the greater impact, but it's not only about the number of people, it's also about the, really the impact on uh, those people. Um, and I'm, I'm nearly at the end of my presentation, so that's the sort of second slide, which is more about the process itself. Um, and it's more going into the step of, of this process. So first, it's quite obvious you need to use um, robust evidence of the likely impact of your decision and policy. And by evidence, we're talking about quantitative evidence or so statistics you may get from national, regional or local report, but also crucially qualitative evidence, which you will get um, in relation to health and social care from 
patients, from families and carers, and from groups who represent the interest. Really, really important not to overseen those. It should relate separately to the three aim of the PSED. Um, the three aim, just to remind you, is to eliminate unlawful discrimination, harassment, and victimization. The second is to advance equality of opportunity, and the third is to foster good relation. When you have a policy or proposed policy or decision, you should think about those three aims separately, because it's possible that one of your policy or decision have an impact on, on one of the same and not the others. Um, and again, when you do that, you should think about duty of reasonable adjustment as part of, of this process. Uh, something that is often um, forgotten is equality impact is not only about uh, identifying negative impact, it, it often is, but it should also be about identifying positive impact and celebrating when your policy or decision, decision is going to advance equality of opportunity, for example. However, if you do force in negative impact, you'll have to identify mitigating action. Um, that's that's quite again uh, from a risk assessment uh, process uh, perspective is is quite uh, a, a usual process. Um, and then a, a sort of final um, final thing in terms of the process, it needs to be a continuing process. So you have clear plan to monitor the actual impact of your policy and decision, including the effect of mitigating action. So what, what does that mean? That means that when you do an equality impact assessment, it's not something you do, uh, take the decision and, and shelve, shelve it. You have to review it regularly because no one is perfect. There will be things that you can't force in. You might have identified mitigating actions that have absolutely no effect. So this process should be able to tell you whether um, your policy and decision have the intended effects, whether your mitigating action are working, and if the mitigating action are not working, if the policy is having a negative impact, you should logically review your policy and decision or um, identify new miti mitigating action. And the last thing I want to say, I said before that you don't have to do a template, uh, an equality impact assessment template or anything like that. However, we would highly recommend for you to have a written record of your thinking. Um, because if you are challenged, including in court, they will want to see the thinking in writing. And my last slide, and I'm not going to spend time on this because my colleague Hannah later is going to talk to you about this, but and you will receive my presentation later. But this is a sort of quality assurance question I give to people uh, on how they can ensure that they conduct a good equality impact assessment if you are a policy officer doing that, or if you are a decision maker that you can ensure that the process has been done properly before you sign off a decision or policy. Thank you very much and I look forward to your question. Claire, thank you very much. A whole lot in there um, and as Claire says, we will be sharing the presentation afterwards for all of that useful information. I think so many good points, but particularly I think the point Claire makes about the accumulative impact of you know, discrete policies and decisions um, that they so often have on the same um, people within our societies and within our communities. But thank you, Claire. We're now going to hear from Lucy Wilkinson, who is the Equality, Diversity and Human Rights Manager for the Care Quality Commission. And Lucy's going to talk to us about how the um, Commission has promoted equality and uh, protected human rights throughout the coronavirus to date. Thank you, Lucy. Thanks. Um, uh, it's a bit, it's a little bit strange doing this and not being able to see how many people are here, but I'm, I'm sure there are quite a lot of people. Um, I am having a bit of difficulty sharing my presentation. It's the first time we've done WebEx, so Sean, I don't know if you can put my presentation up. I don't seem to get a share content option. Just give me yes. one second, I'll get it up for you. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Sean. Okay, um, can I just also have a little check from people that people can hear me okay? Little thumbs up or something, something in the chat? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, great, okay. So what I'm gonna talk about is, um, as has been extensively trailed already, about how um, as a regulator, we ensured 
um, equality and tried also to reduce health inequalities um, using the public sector equality duty during COVID-19. Now, we don't actually have a uh, formal health inequalities duty, um, but there's such a close link between reducing health inequalities and um, and promoting equality that sometimes I think it's a bit of a bit of an artificial divide, but um, that's probably a different presentation, so I won't dwell on that point. So if you want to move on to the next slide, then, Sean, that'd be helpful. Thank you. So for those of you who are, who are not aware, I, I'm aware that there are people from all sorts of sectors um, joining this call. Um, the Care Quality Commission is the independent regulator of health and adult social care in England. And our role in one sentence is to make sure that health and social care services provide people with safe, effective, compassionate, high quality care. And we encourage those services, health and social care services to improve. So um, when we say people, we mean all people. We don't mean a particular group of people. Our role is to ensure that all people receive good services. So equality and indeed human rights are very, very um, crucial and essential to our core purpose. Now, my main message today, and it builds on a lot of what um, Claire's just been, been presenting, is that um, actually it's the attitude of those involved in assessing and taking action on the public sector equality duty is going to be the main driver of the outcomes for people using your services or people affected by your policies, not the process or the equality impact assessment form that you that you undertake. Though obviously there is some good practice around process that care that Claire has um, outlined. It isn't about rigidly following a fixed process. It's about, um, in my view, it's about being being really committed to using the public sector quality duty to improve your services. Next slide, please, Sean. So um, I tried to uh, kind of draw this on a little bit of a diagram about um, what is the attitude in your organisation towards a public sector quality duty. And so um, on the um, left hand column, you can see um, we, we've got um, the attitude and we've got a five different potential attitudes that create five different completion approaches for the equality impact assessment and then have different impacts on people. And I'll just spend a couple of minutes going through each of those. So, um, and, and I've experienced this working as an equality specialist in, in, um, in organisations. Um, and it isn't necessarily the same across an organisation. Different people within your organisation responsible for different areas might be coming to the to to the kind of the task of doing an equality impact assessment with these different attitudes. So the the first attitude is that the um, the impact assessment is a burden, and therefore the completion approach for the impact assessment would be minimise the information that you have on it and avoid it creating any actions as a result. So very much at the extreme tick box end of of of, of meeting the public sector equality duty. And unsurprisingly, that's likely to have very little impact on people. I mean, obviously, the policy itself might have a negative impact, but doing the equality impact assessment is likely to have little impact on people. The next level up, I would argue, is um, a kind of uh, using the equality impact um, assessment process to reduce risk to the organisation. So what you're trying to do is possibly to justify your current position but to take action if legally necessary. So if um, you, if the impact assessment suggests that you, it will create, um, uh, you won't be eliminating discrimination, you'll be creating something discriminatory. So it would have a minor impact on people. It might prevent unlawful discrimination. Moving up the scale, you get to what I would call maximum mitigation. So that's where the organisation is being a lot more robust in looking for risks to equality and looking for actions to address any risks that might appear as a result in the change in, in, in which is proposed. And that will prevent negative impacts of the change. But as Claire's just explained, actually, the equality impact assessment um, has a much more a kind of positive role as well, because what you can use an equality impact assessment for, and a really good equality impact assessment will do, is to look for actions to address opportunities to advance equality and to foster good relations between groups, which are two arms 
of the public sector equality duty, as well as um, making sure that you avoid discrimination. So if you take that approach, you, um, you're moving towards advancing equality and, and creating more good impact outcomes for, from the change that is proposed on more people. But then I'm going to argue that there's a, a stage beyond that, and the stage beyond that is actually to use the public sector equality duty to create change at different levels, both within your organisation and outside of your organisation. And that's to use both the actions um, that, are, that you put in place as a result of the equality impact assessment and as the process itself and involving people in the process and publicising your quality impact assessment as a means of wide scale change towards transforming systems and towards greater social justice and equality. So that's quite a high level um, ambition um, beyond maximum mitigation. So I thought it would be really interesting um, if we can all be really honest and I'll do this as well is, and this will be completely anonymous, nobody will see the answers, is for you to, there's a little poll in the Q&A, and for if you could say generally what you think the attitude in your organisation is currently towards a public sector equality duty. Do people see it as a burden? Are people interested in risk reduction? Are people interested in maybe maximum mitigation, like address all risks? Are people keen on spotting opportunities um, as well as risks? Or do people want to create positive change at different levels through the PSED? So we'll have a minute or so to all click one of those options in the poll. And then you have to click the submit bu button at the bottom right hand side, and then we'll see what the results are. Okay, Sean, can you show the results? Yeah, just get just takes a second. Okay. Okay, so actually what we've got is I recognize that some people won't have answered either because maybe your organization hasn't got a, you're in, in the not for profit sector and you don't generally do um, do these because you don't have public sector contracts or whatever. But that's quite interesting, isn't it? That the most common answer is that people are seeing equality impact assessments as a risk reduction process. So that was 33 answers. And then the second was people, uh, organisations looking at both opportunities and risks. The third most common was about maximum mitigation. Um, I'm pleased to see burden came out as bottom of the of the uh, of of the five options. But actually, we've got uh, we're still some way towards all the organisations. And I take it that actually, as a group of people, we're people whose organisations are quite interested in equality because at least we've been able to send one person on this on this on this webinar there's still a kind of a, a, a mostly down towards risk reduction and mitigation um though it's good to see some people are actually creating positive change through the PSED um okay we'll move on to the next slide then so um what happened during COVID-19? So, um, as I'm sure many of us were, we were thrown into COVID-19 um, when suddenly everything in our organisations were up in the air. There was a very high level of uncertainty. We didn't know how the pandemic was going to, was going to pan out. We didn't know um, whether, for example, um, our inspectors will be able to carry on doing their roles. We didn't know what the overall uh, the overall uh, impact of the pandemic would be on people who use services or the organisations that we regulate. Fairly quickly, there was a rapid change to the way that we delivered our regulatory functions. We decided fairly early on that we would stop routine inspection visits. We would still inspect where there were particularly high risks that we couldn't 
uh, we couldn't look at remotely, including we always said human rights risks where we couldn't assure um, we couldn't assure ourselves, but without going on site. But our general program of routine inspections were stopped. We decided that we would take a, a, an approach where we're more we were more supporting providers to provide good care. So we were doing more support phone calls to providers, still um, still based on what our uh, our criteria are for good care, but with a focus on things like infection and prevention control and so on. But there was also in the context an emerging equality and human rights risks in health and social care that came into the public domain at different points during the pandemic, though we did try and predict some of them and we did um, unfortunately were able to predict some of them um, a, a bit earlier on than they, they came into the public domain. So what was our approach to our um, equality and human rights impact assessment? The first thing was recognising the need to balance thoroughness with speed. So we put quite a lot of people onto the assessment. So um, I manage a very small equality and human rights team. There's only three of us. Um, and we all went onto the assessment. We engaged people across the commission on the assessment. We integrated human rights in. As Claire said, that's standard CQC practice. So we have standard human rights questions on our, on our template. We don't always use our standard template for all our equality and human rights impact assessments, but we always expect there to be human rights content in there. Um, we actually signed off the action plan on the 23rd of March, so the day that lockdown started, so it was really, really early on. That was after quite a lot of engagement, so our, the action plan was signed off by our chief executive, having been through, we, we put in an emergency response um, system and the action plan went through silver and gold command and got signed off by the chief executive um, on the 23rd of March. We ensured there were senior owners on the actions. We set up um, calls weekly where my team um, would monitor progress on the actions and, and follow through where we felt that there wasn't actions, uh, that the progress wasn't happening quick enough. So we kind of ran the impact assessment, almost like a, a, a kind of rapid project plan, if you like. We um, we iterated the the um, the assessment as as the pandemic developed. So there were some things where we thought there might be um, there might be unequal impacts, particularly around older and disabled people, and also people in black and minority ethnic communities. But as the pandemic panned out, we've, we discovered the nature of those impacts in a bit more detail and therefore had to adjust the actions that we needed to take. We committed to 28 actions in the action plan on the impact assessment, which is quite a long list. Um, and um, one thing that we decided to do early on was to share the assessment really widely to influence other people, recognising that other people would be needing to do equality impact assessment. So that's part of moving up that um, that uh, scale towards creating positive change. So um, we did things like in the chief inspector's letters, we mentioned the equality impact assessment, we put a hyperlink into it. So general letters about what we were doing on the, on the pandemic. We set up new calls with all the equality leads of NHS trusts. We uh, we did we tweeted about our EIA. We kind of treated it as a, as a kind of public facing document that we wanted to share. And I've just got a link here, which will take you to to the latest version of the EIA. Doing the iteration also helped us in that the second time round we could actually say what we'd already done from the first action plan, so it showed people of the progress that we were making. Next slide. So what were some of the issues that we that we covered in the EIA? We covered issues across all protected characteristics, but these were some of the, the, the kind of big ones that we needed to take a lot of action on. So the first thing was about um, blanket, um, blanket or discriminatory decisions about access to healthcare for older and disabled people, which we had concerns might lead to avoidable deaths. So there were issues about um, uh, blanket decisions to uh, to place do not attempt CPR decisions um, on people in care homes. 
there were blanket decisions that people would not get access to acute care if they were in a care home because there would be an advanced care plan that said that they needed to be cared for in the care home. More recently, we've also discovered um, some concerns around um, uh, where care pathways have been changed and additional triage systems put in place in acute care, which meant that um, people, um, disabled people and older people, particularly those in care homes, might not, uh, might not be getting access to emergency acute care on the same basis as others. So there's one, there's a whole set of issues there around around kind of access to care. Um, I'll, I'll skip to the to the to the right hand um, box on the same on the same row as well because that was bal also some other issues relating to right to life about hospital discharge from care homes without testing, issues about PPE in care homes and so on. So there were some there were some issues about access to healthcare, but there were also issues about. Uh, about people not getting enough support when they were in adult social care, which were very large issues that we spent quite a lot of time on. Then there was um, the disproportionate deaths of black and minority ethnic people, both people using services and in the workforce, um, which there was, people will remember, there was a lot of debate about what the underlying causes of that might be and whether the underlying causes were related to um, clinical differences, whether they were related to wider health inequalities or whether they were related to um, to access and experience and outcomes when people actually were trying to use healthcare services. Obviously, not all of that is within our control as a regulator, but we wanted to take rapid action if we could to try and ensure that black and minority ethnic people did get good access to care. So we did things like we shared um, we shared good practice around uh, materials that the voluntary sector had largely produced actually around, around uh, encouraging black and minority ethnic people to use healthcare services in appropriate formats and appropriate languages around expectations, for example, around refugees access um, and the, well more so asylum seekers actually access to and vulnerable migrants access to emergency care for COVID related symptoms and so on. So we did as much as we could to try and mitigate the disproportionate deaths through information sharing and through what we, we put into our into our regulatory methodology. We also collect information about the deaths of people with a learning disability and autistic people using regulated services and we published information about disproportionate deaths and tried to do some national policy work around increasing testing for people um, in in health and social in social care settings who have a learning disability or are autistic who were initially um, not included in the in the COVID nineteen testing that was happening in care homes for older people. Um, there were there's also and this is still the thing that's playing out now more the long term unequal impact of pausing preventative services. Um, on disabled people, black and minority ethnic people, children living in deprivation, other groups as well. So, for example, trans people, access to gender identity clinics. Um, so, we're still working very much on how we do that going that work going forward in, in addressing that. And finally, um, there were some unnecessary blanket restrictions on liberty, which relate to kind of human rights in relation to Article 8 and Article 5. Um, including use of restraint for social distancing purposes, both chemical restraint and, and physical restraint that might not be the least restrictive practice, um, and blanket restrictions on visitors beyond national guidance with no mitigation put in place so that people could still have contact with their family and friends. So there was a lot of kind of fairly big issues that we dealt with. Okay, next slide please, Sean. So types of actions we put into the EIA, we, some was about intelligence improvement, data collection, how we use qualitative intelligence, phone calls coming into our call centre, for example, relating to equality and human rights risks, how we incorporate the key equality and human rights issues that we were seeing into our regulatory methodology, because we were still contacting services, asking them questions, even if we were doing it virtually rather than through um, crossing the threshold. 
um, engagement and learning for our own staff on key equality and human rights issues in COVID-19, especially inspection staff. Um, engagement with health and care providers, both around our expectations, for example, producing quite strong statements about do not attempt uh, uh, CPR and also around access to care, but also helping providers to deliver best practice, um, for example, sharing good practice, sharing um, the material available in different languages and in different formats. And also we did some increased engagement with people who use services at both a service level and a national level to try and ensure that we were getting good information from people about what the unequal impacts were that they were they were facing. And for example, we carried out a survey of black and minority ethnic people, a small survey that we commissioned out. We carried out a small survey of people with a learning disability and autism. And then the last thing is that we try, we, and this was a, our chief executive actually took responsibility for the, for the national policy influencing um, action on our EIA um, about the, the issues that, are, that I've raised, um, including also the kind of increased risk of closed cultures and human rights, um, human rights risks when, when services, there are less people going in, in and out of services. So those were the types of actions that, that we covered in our 28 actions. Okay, next, next slide. So um, lastly, just so what's next for us? We're actually closing down the our COVID-19 EIA because we're moving into a new uh, EIA for our transitional regulatory approach, which will start in September. Um, as health and social care services come out of the immediate pandemic response into reset, and for those of you in, in the health the health sector anyway in relation to the phase three um, expectations from NHS England um, but also across all sectors so for adult social care it'll be different um, and so on so we're looking at a new uh, approach to how we regulate we can do a bit more on site than we could um, and so on so we'll be doing we're setting up a new EIA for that we've also been undertaking some local area reviews of how providers have collaborated um, in in the pandemic and we're, we've been assessing the first round of how those have gone from an equality and human rights perspective and building that into our next rounds and also we're in the middle of we were even before the pandemic of doing a, a, our new long-term strategy which we're going out to consultation on early in 2021. So I've learned quite a lot of lessons myself about how we can use EIAs better to create positive change at different levels um, uh, that we want to build into these three next big EIAs that we are doing, that we carry on doing smaller EIAs for other smaller policy changes. The first is around senior ownership of actions and monitoring those actions and iterating the actions as a result. And that then also how the EIA can be used as a tool to raise risks and mitigations and also the opportunities and benefits of, of carrying out an, a, a really thorough equality and human rights impact assessment. Okay, so finally, um, a final question for you about where would you like um, your organisation to be at, we talked at the beginning about where is your organisation, so having heard the presentation, where would you like your organisation to be on the scale in terms of how you use the PSED? So, if you can do that poll now, that'd be great. So Sean is going to do the big reveal in a minute. Okay, so we've got that. That's uh, that's um, that's quite interesting, isn't it? So um, uh, we most of us want our organisations to be at the point where we're creating positive change through the PSED. So. 
the question to reflect on, I think, when we go back to our organisations is what, what do we need to do to move to where towards where we want to be on that scale? Thanks. That's the end of my presentation. Lucy, thank you very much. That was a, just a really rich exploration of the issues that your organisation is facing, which, of course, touch on um, a lot of the issues in relation with other issues. I think it was really good to hear about how you made EIA really visible through all the work that you were doing. Um, and yeah, where, where you started and where you took us back to, um, I'm sure we'll all agree that, you know, this is so much about the attitude and it's about um, why we want to do EQIA as opposed to having to do it. I think that's a um, very valuable reminder. Thank you, Lucy. We're now going to move on to Joe Hooper. Joe is the um, equality, sorry, corporate equality officer for Devon County Council. And we're going to hear from Joe about um, how the council has considered and responded to needs of different communities um, throughout this crisis. Thank you, Joe. Good morning. Can you all hear me and see my presentation? Is that okay? I'm going to assume that's a yes. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, I'm Joe Hooper. I'm the Corporate Equality Officer at Devon County Council. Um, I'd like to thank the HRC for inviting me to speak at today's event, and I hope you find this informative. I've certainly found it really um, helpful to reflect on some of the things that we've done um, over the past six months. So just a little bit about Devon County Council. We're a two-tier authority and our unitary neighbours are Torbay Council and Plymouth um, City Council. Um, together we form um, Devon County. Um, you may well have been here on holiday. We're a largely rural area, very lovely with beaches and moorland, and we have one city, Exeter. Um, now, the rurality has been absolutely great for social distancing, um, but obviously it comes with um, increased isolation and loneliness, um, difficulties accessing services and gaps in uh, broadband and mobile coverage. I'm hoping that my signal's going <laughs> to be okay for this presentation. Um, our population is around 800,000, and our census um, stats show that we have a, an aging population. Nearly half are over 70, one in five are disabled, and 5.1% um, are black, Asian, and minority ethnic. That includes white other category, and 1.6 are minority religions, so all those religions excluding Christianity. Hospitality and tourism are um, big industries down here, obviously, 5.5% of the local economy, and it makes up 12% of the workforce. Um, so we've been generally good down here in Devon with our social distancing um, and hygiene. Um, we also, there was no discharge into care homes and the community where the COVID status of the patient was unclear. As a result, we've, um, our statistics are, are fairly good compared to the rest of the country in relation to coronavirus cases. So as of last week, we had 1,317 and uh, 214 um, deaths. Moving on, um, so back um, in April, um, not April, March, <laughs> this all started off, um, we all quickly had to adapt to working from home. Everything was thrown up in the air, people were redeployed, our work priorities changed, but thankfully we had excellent ICT, which meant we were able to adapt very, very quickly. Had it been two years ago, um, it would have been a very different story because we didn't have the kind of kit that we've got now. A pandemic incident management team was set up through uh, Microsoft Teams, and we had sales including excess death, PPE, uh, shielding, communication. So lots of different sales were set up. And for me, having access to all that activity um, through Microsoft Teams, that was vital for my quality work. It made, meant I could link with people, keep up to date with what was going on. We've been chosen as a Beacon Council to develop and share best practice, um, one of um, 11 nationally. So we've now moved into local outbreak management with equality representation on, um, that's me, uh, on our Public Health Protection Board and Team Devon Local Engagement Board, which is for um, different sectors, uh, education, private business, voluntary sector, um, represented on that group. So the quality impact assessment, we talked a bit about templates. I decided to um, coordinate a single um, corporate kind of cumulative um, impact assessment for the council, um, looking at the risks and impacts of the pandemic itself, the so coronavirus, also the lockdown measures and the service changes. So looking at all of that um, together in one go, um, 
So normally our impact assessment process is I, I ask services to do their own assessments, um, but this time I decided to step in and support uh, people because everything was so up in the air. We were dealing with, um, you know, a, a new world. Um, consulted with community groups on that assessment and also um, trying to keep up to date with all those reports that started to reveal deeper inequalities arising from the pandemic. So things around like domestic violence and exploitation. And it was really um, important to try and keep up on top of that. And, and, and it was also quite tough as well. The assessment eventually became an 80 page uh, document. So it's very big. Um, I've also done some deep dive um, assessments for sales. So, for example, one around excess thefts, which I will cover in a minute. Um, I'm really keen on networking and set up a national network for equality impact assessment in COVID through the local government association knowledge hub. Um, into our local outbreak management phase. So there's a new impact assessment for that, slightly different format and also um, recovery. And some of the things we flagged, I know Sally Parker's on, on on the call, so um, in, in, in the room, uh, and she helped flag the issue of clear face masks for, for people with disabilities. We also set up web pages uh, with an alternative format statement, links to translated materials, materials so Doctors of the World and Sign Health, um, Easy Read, which we produce um, in house with Learning Disability Devon. Um, and also, we've got access to our sign language interpreters, um, interpreters live, which is a remote video interpreting service. Excuse me, I just don't try to think. Um, we have also um, at, um, extended our language line telephone interpreting uh, contract so that other people could access that um, because face to face interpreting was um, a challenge. Um, understanding local language needs and issues for migrant workers has been um, really key through um, this whole. Pand pandemic. Um, we've run communications campaigns and um, around uh, domestic violence, drug trafficking, exploitation and scam awareness. Also been uh, making requests for um, information in different formats, um, easy read BSL and foreign languages from government departments. So looking at our social care response, um, providing top up boxes, referring people to community health needed to be catered for. Um, we did a deep dive impact assessment on PPE. So um, gender impacts obviously um, were a big issue with um, some kit not fitting um, female bodies. It was designed for male bodies um, and providing PPE for unpaid carers as well. Um, we had service user feedback from autistic people and ADHD, ADHD people around um, Lockdown, they were struggling to um, maybe comply with some of the restrictions. So, thankfully, our police partners um, were able to brief their, their officers to um, take a safeguarding approach rather than a criminal justice approach. So, that's making a reasonable adjustment for people on the street. Um, we provided tech support for families, homeschooling, and weekly calls for refugee families. Um, now, a lot of things did go online for people, but for some people, online wasn't an option. So for deaf people, we maintained face-to-face um, -face visits, obviously, with PPE. From our care homes um, who were concerned about people dying alone and wanting um, last rights, and um, with priests being a vulnerable group, it was difficult for people to go into care homes to provide this. So I liaised with our Deaf and Face and Belief Forum um, to create a guide the existing guidance is out there around uh, blessings and last rites. It was sort of created for a kind of a normal situation. So it didn't take in that into account the need for social isolation and, and infection control. So we developed a guide with um, basically it's links to um, YouTube videos of um, prayer and songs so that care workers can play those um, resources for people to give them comfort. Also, um, thankfully, um, our excess death work um, only ever reached planning stage, and, and hopefully it will only ever be in a planning um, stage. But we had lots of conversations about um, washing, wrapping, and PPE for Muslim communities, uh, uh, establishing this, that, um, sufficient burial plots for Muslim communities because there was a shortage, talking about um, religious requirements in the temporary morgue, um, and a lot of that was about managing expectation as well as meeting needs. Some things couldn't be accommodated, for example, having a candle, 
ha having a candle beside somebody or um, having, you know, mass gatherings and wakes, um, that obviously things like that couldn't take place in, in the temporary morgue. Funeral directors were given access to telephone and video interpreting services if needed because of the um, difficulties with having face-to-face -face interpreters. Uh, but like I say, none, none of this had to be put into um, place, thankfully. Um, we've also set up bereavement support and mental health and wellbeing um, projects. Some of the activ other activities, um, setting up uh, grant funding for communities, and so a number of protected characteristic groups benefited from that, um, identifying sources of water for travellers and gypsies um, through our district councils and having a joint protocol um, for dealing with unauthorised encampments. Like many of you, um, we picked up on the issue of black people, black Asian and minority ethnic people will be um, having higher rates of death and severe illness illness through COVID. Um, so that was added um, to our risk assessment. And also we had it with staff, we had a number of people with learning disability employed as interns and apprenticeships, and they all had um, like a face-to-face -face support worker, job coach working with them. So one of the reasons adjustments we were able to uh, make was for them to um, support them remotely. So that was really good that they were able to continue in, in work. So, moving into coming out of lockdown, um, guidance for businesses on um, creating um, when they when they're looking at their layouts and queuing, making reasonable adjustments for disabled customers. For example, letting them sit down and maybe jump a queue. Um, when our recycling centres reopened, we had large vehicle rest restrictions in place to begin with to cope with demand. And our impact assessment obviously highlighted that, that that could disadvantage people with mobility scooters who generally have larger vehicles. So reasonable adjustments were made there. We developed a tourism charter and have made that available in um, different languages. And finally, yeah, so communications has been a big um, issue, I think, throughout this whole uh, pandemic in, in trying to get messages across to people. And, you know, we have a diverse community out there and many different languages are spoken. Um, we have a lot of migrant workers who come to work in um, particularly sort of manual work. So with factory workers, uh, farming, um, sports, and maybe don't have good, good English. Um, so we're now developing a project on, um, so it's eight animated videos with subtitles and audio. So it's going to be fully accessible, approximately three minutes each. There's going to be an English version and 23 foreign languages and a BSL version. That's a huge project in itself. Um, so we're going to first pilot that with four videos and four languages uh, plus English. It's going to cover just some of the basic principles of um, social distancing and hygiene, isolating, uh, test and trace service and, and support. So support things like um, signposting people to information about statutory sick pay. Um, it's going to be as future proof as possible. So we're not going to cover specifics like the rules around how many people you can meet and where you can meet. Because that, that varies by area and that can change. Um, and we're not going to overbrand it or over localize it so that it can be used by um, other areas. Um, you, as you can see in the slide on the right hand side is um, the, t the template that we use to get the um, translations done. So it's broken down by um, sentence, um, mainly for the subtitling of the videos, but it also means that we can use it for, you know, if we want to extract information for other uses like a leaflet. And we're also going to make the um, videos available to um, community influencers, so people out in the community, the voluntary sector, maybe who might want to produce their own videos, like a talking heads videos, because not everybody, um, you know, not everybody will like the animation. So it's giving people um, choices and different routes to get those messages um, across. So um, that's it for me. And finally. Uh, links. Um, so I think you're going to get these slides later as well. So these are some of the links, uh, some of the work I've talked about in my presentation. So uh, thank you. <laughs> Joe, thank you. And yes, we will be sharing the presentations. There's a lot of rich information there. And um, I mean, for my part, that was just quite humbling actually to hear the range of very, very different issues that um, your council and I'm sure all councils had to respond to very 
obviously and all of the very practical things you had to do, but all the very practical things that you had to deal with. So thank you very much for that. Our last presentation is from Anna Wilfew, principal um, of the Commission. And Anna, you're going to talk to us about the new guidance that the Commission has been developing, particularly for English public sector duty bearers. I am. Um, hopefully everyone can see my presentation now. Just double check that. Sean, can you see that? I can see it. Can you put it on slideshow view, Anna, so that... Yep. Mm -hmm. There we go. Just make sure I can scroll through because I know I had that problem yesterday. Um, first of all, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, as Kath said, I work for the Commission. I lead our strategy um, and engagement, engagement actually with um, other regulators, inspectorates and ombudsmen. So I've got a couple of updates for you first. Um, the first is we are currently updating our public sector quality duty technical guidance. This will now incorporate the um, uh, GPG reporting measures, but also the new timelines that go along with that. There is no change to that, so don't you know? Hopefully, see that as a surprise. Um, but we have recognised that our um, technical guidance on the uh, on our website at the moment is out of date, so that will be updated by the end of October. Um, hopefully, the beginning of October. But um, you know, bear with us. Um, the current guidance that is online. Um, is valid until that comes out, and we will um, obviously put that out to the England network when that's when that is available. Um, and just to confirm, I know we've had questions before about what are we enforcing this year, and we have in England put that on hold for this year, so we won't be enforcing any of the specific duties. But what I would say is I'd really encourage you to still report if you can, um, so that you don't have any gaps in your data going forward, especially during this exceptional year where actually that data might be even more important than you usual to identify um, any potential inequalities as you put policies and procedures in place. So you mentioned about the technical guidance. The other thing that um, I want to introduce you to is actually a new piece of guidance that we've written to really allow you to assess the equality impact decisions and policies you're making now. Now, what I would say is this is not a template. Um, we're really keen to really uh, you know, say that because we know that there are lots of different ways that people do it and there is no no set way but what we have found is people really want those kind of steps as to what they should be thinking about what is what is kind of good practice um you'll receive this um after the webinar um it is a bit of a sneak preview because it's not gone on our website just yet so it isn't live so i would say please don't share it at this point and it is a draft document um, but we don't anticipate it will change and hopefully it'll give you some um, more substance to what we've talked about today um I won't move on to the next slide yet. I'll just kind of talk a bit more about why it's so important. Um, I think we've all acknowledged that coronavirus has really kind of established new challenges. And I think um, Lucy and Joe have really kind of highlighted what that has meant to them. Um, and we know that there's been a disproportionate impact um, on particular communities and it has ex really exacerbated the exi existing structural disadvantages um, in our country. Now, as public organisations, um, I know that we have to do some, have some charities and have also signed in today, but hopefully this is, you know, good learning for everyone, is that your response to the pandemic must re recognise these unequal impacts and ensure that measures put in place now don't lead to increase in discrimination and disadvantage over the years. Now, we know, obviously, the public sector quality duty, as we've heard throughout all the speakers today, um, is it really enables you to make those fair decisions um, in a really transparent and accountable way and really considering the needs and the rights of different communities um, and integrating assessment um, of equality impacts from the very start of new um, policies not only saves time but also helps prevent costly mistakes that as I think Claire mentioned at the beginning can lead to litigation um, and enforcement action by us. I know one of the questions has been about enforcement action, so I can cover that at the end if, if people feel, or we can leave that for the actual um, uh, panel event at the end. So the guidance that we've put out is to really help you strengthen your work to protect people um, that are in the most vulnerable situations in society, really upholding your um, country's places, our country's place as a world leader in human rights as well, and helping us shape shape what the new normal is because i think that's what we are fundamentally going to have to get used to is there is a new normal and we want to ensure that no one is left behind now the actual guidance is um, going to follow eight steps now i know we're short on time now so i'm not going to go through them all because the guidance will actually go through them um you know with you 
Um, but it's essentially just a thought process that you can follow um, and make into your own template if that's what um, would be helpful. Um, but essentially, these are things that you should really be thinking about when you're trying to assess the impact of any decision making. Um, I want to be really clear, um, the duties have not changed, so I'm not asking you to do anything new with this guidance. I don't want anybody to feel that we are saying this is how you have to do it. We're just suggesting this is best practice at this point in time. Um, An equality duty would help you kind of really understand during these times when um, change is really, very, really rapid, we appreciate that constant reassessment of what you're doing and the policies you're putting in place is going to be really important and assessing equality throughout that will really come to the forefront as to why it's important to make this part of um, your everyday work. This shouldn't be something that is done on an aside. It helps you make decision decisions as you go along. So that's really where we're at with that guidance piece. So I really want to kind of leave that there because I appreciate we are quite short of time um, and just move on very quickly to something I'm going to ask you. Now, we appreciate from the Commission that actually we don't always get it right and certainly the duty bearer doesn't get it right. But we really want to understand is where is the difficulty that, um, you know, there is in understanding the public sector quality duty and what could we usefully do to help you understand um, and support decision making um, around all things equality. Now we've put a few things together. Um, you'll see there that there is a polling um, uh, options where we've we've made these suggestions. And what I'm really keen to say is these are just our suggestions. We really want to learn from you as to where best we can place our resources and our activities. So if you could fill out that poll, I would really appreciate it. I'll just give you a few seconds there to do that. And then Sean, if you could perhaps share that. Are you able to share that, Sean? Not sure. I'm not hearing anything back. So what I'll do is I'll just I'll just carry on at the moment. Um, what I would say is we're not going to be able to offer you an individualised um, uh, service. Oh, there you go. So um, some really interesting ones. They're quite broadly across lots of them are, are seem to be useful, particularly case studies. Um, for information, we are actually, um, we've recently launched a project that will be looking at gathering good practice case studies on these um, to enable um, us to be able to put those on the website for you to refer to. Um, some will be sectoral based, others will be broader than that. Um, but also the decision making template and webinars is really popular to see and also interestingly the templates. So I think that's something potentially we might have to revisit. Um, so thank you very much for that and we'll take that away and see what we can um, do with that and also the survey that um, some of you really thankfully have um, filled in. We'll also be putting out a few things over the next few weeks to again get that feel for what is what is useful to you. We don't want to assume um, what is useful to you, we want to make something that's really practical and will work for you. Um, as I mentioned we can't offer an individual approach um, but what I would say is that um, Sorry, I've just been distracted there. Uh, I would say that um, we are looking for those themes. And just a reminder from Claire that, again, if you do have any um, examples of cumulative impact case studies, we'd be really and particularly interested to hear about those. I would encourage you to contact us um, about any concerns that you have about where we could improve that, that dialogue with you um, over compliance and what you need. Um, but what I'll do at the moment is I will leave it there um, and I'll hand back to Kath. Thank you very much, Ella. And I'm going to invite all of the um, speakers to your cameras on if you can. Um, so we're all here to take any questions. But thank you, Anna. That was a very um, practical summarising at the end and a very sincere ask from us out from the Commission and um, to people for your feedback on what would really work best for you. So we have um, 15 minutes before we need to wrap up. We are hoping that we get questions from you there. Uh, as I said before, there is a Q&A on the side of your screens. 
and please do use that and I'll be working alongside Shan to pick up questions and put them to the panel. I haven't had notice of any yet, but I will use this opportunity, Anna, you mentioned there, and we did get a question earlier on about what enforcement action can the HRC impose, and I'll ask you to reflect on that, and others may have some views on that as well, um, because you're right in what you said, the, um, that is certainly one of the, the implications that people need to think about as a result of not taking action and, and not being proactive and not approaching PACD with the um, attitude that, that Lucy talked about, um, bears a number of costs. So, they can be in litigation, but of course, also it's in terms of the, the cost of downstream costs of not getting services right in the first place. And we all know, again, back to the cumulative impact of what goes wrong when we don't get things right in the first place. Um, but Anna, did you want to say, come back on the um, particular question about the enforcement action of EHRC? Sure. And what I would say is there, there is more detail on our website about what enforcement action that we can do. Um, but as a very quick kind of overview, there are various um, investigations and inquiries that we can um, launch, which compel people to give us evidence. Um, and off the back of those, we can issue unlawful act notices, but also take out pre enforcement actions such as Section 23s, um, which essentially um, we give recommendations that you need must apply and agree to. Um, and should you not not agree to them or not to carry out those activities, then um, we can support that through the courts in order to take more um, kind of significant action against your organisation. We can also carry out what's called Section 31 Public Sector Quality Duty Assessments. And again, those um, would lead to recommendations that you would be compelled to comply to improve your services in a way that we agree with you. I think generally that we prefer to um, go along the route of um, compliance through interventions that um, certainly my directorate lead on, where we will give you that support and guidance as to how you can improve your um, public sector quality duty obligations prior to any enforcement action we would take. Certainly there is obviously the reputational damage that you might incur by not following um, the public sector quality duty, as well as the financial financial impact and discrimination claims. I think what's really interesting at the moment is there's a recent study about um, women going into tech organisations where 60% of them are looking at your um, GPG reports, for instance, as to whether they are they think that you're a good employer. And I know that's within more within the private industry with tech, but I think we're seeing that more broadly across public sector organisation as well. So there's lots of implications, but from an enforcement point of view, we have a, a, a wealth of powers and levers that we can use to um, support your compliance. Thank you, Anna. Does anyone else want to come in on that one? Or I do now have some good questions here. So I'll put another one to you. Okay. Um, invite panellists to comment on integrating the socioeconomic duty. Um, and maybe put that to you first, Joe, in terms of how you might consider that within Devon, but but others may want to um, comment on that as well. Yeah, I mean, it's simply yeah. a case of adding um, it to our toolkit. So we've got a standard form um, um, that, that, that we have published on our website. So you, you can actually um, see that form, it's in the public domain. Um, so it, so within the protected character, the list of protected characteristics, um, um, socioeconomic issues are just added as another kind of characteristic. So a look at things like um, rural, air, rural and urban um, deprivation. So whether people are living in a, an area of deprivation, their occupation or economic status, family, um, dependence, skills, education. Um, so you know, it's, it's kind of things like that and ac access to public transport. Um, so all those wider issues, the kind of prompts within our impact assessment toolkit. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I, I can comment on that as well. So we don't we don't currently have a, a socioeconomic um, impact on our form. Um, I think it's a number of years back we we considered it, but then um, but then in terms of the, in terms of the uh, legal duty, we did it wasn't added in. But we do we do we are looking at how we integrate our work more generally between uh, across health inequalities and equality. Um, in our future strategy, and I think we will be doing more on socioeconomic um, issues. But the other thing is that they're not, there's a lot of interdependency, isn't there? So 
Um, so some of the causes of, say, um, inequality for disabled people or for black and minority ethnic people in particular, or for some older people, might be about poverty as well. So we do try in our existing protected characteristics that are covered in the Act to consider um, to consider those interdependencies across different protected characteristics and to consider socioeconomic um, impacts within that, but we don't separately have a, we don't have a separate category as such on our form. Thank you, Jo. Um, Anna or Claire, would you like to say anything about socioeconomic impact in particular, or we can move on? No. Okay. It's a question, I think, um, an interesting one, I wonder if I was thinking myself, I mean, obviously all of you as panelists and indeed a lot of the people who um, will be listening into this are very familiar with the impacts of inequality and of lack of equality and lack of opportunity. Um, and I think Anna's right in something that she said earlier that um, much of this is as it was before, but equally, um, I'd be interested to know what the experience of COVID has particularly taught you about inequality and how you might respond? Do you think the response needs to be different? So what have you learned from this? Um, and what do you think that that, what others might learn from that and think particularly government and policy? So, so, so what, what has COVID taught us? Who would like to go first on that one? Um, Lucy. You look like you're ready to come back. Oh, it's a big question, isn't it? So, um, I think um, it's it, uh, it, this might sound a bit pessimistic. It's taught me that some of the things that I thought had gone away haven't, in fact, gone away, particularly around um, some of the policy decisions that's been made about access to healthcare for older and disabled people, um, where we've seen um, where we've seen a kind of hierarchy of who's 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 worth saving to put it quite bluntly um so that so yeah so that's been a big a big thing i think the other thing is that the combination of having covid and black lives matter at the same time um has also which we haven't talked about has also had quite a big impact and and i would say a really positive impact on people understanding more what the uh, the connections are between um between racism um, and and unequal outcomes, and that 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 that, that has ha that has been really really positive. Um, but there are intersectionalities in that. For example, the first care homes where large numbers of people died, um, partly, partly because the pandemic started out in London, but that were care homes with a large number of black and minority ethnic older people in them. So you get these kind of combinations of things that happen as well. I think there is um I, I think there is more of a understanding of the importance, the centrality of addressing inequality in health and social care post the pandemic. And I think that's shown by the NHS England phase three letter, which is really strong. But it's about ensuring that the voices of those people who may not be uh may not be able to advocate as easily um, or may not be as heard as heard as well are always included in in those conversations. Thank you, Jo. Uh, so, Lucy, Jo. Yeah. Um, so I, I kind of reflect back to I think it was back in May time. I was I switched on the the news, BBC News, and I think the whole program. The whole of the news, BBC News, main main news program, not even local, national, was everything that I'd been working on that day. Um, so I think what this has highlighted is that equality is really important. And I think if people don't get equality now, <laughs> then I don't I don't know where we are because I, you know I think it is just highlighted that this is such an important subject area. I also think it's highlighted that data, having really good data collection and monitoring is really important. And I know there are some real challenges around that, um, particularly with, it, you know, class how we classify people and people, you know, wanting to maybe give their information to us, but it is vitally important um, because it's through that data that we've been able to highlight some of those inequalities and then take action. 
I also think it's taught me to um, be really creative. I'm a quite a creative person anyway, um, but it's actually um, highlighted the need to, to, you know, you've got to think fast, you've got to think creatively um, about how, how you do things. So, yeah. Thanks, Joe. Anna, Claire, Anna. Yeah, I just want to reiterate really what Joe has just said um, about actually it's taken the pand pandemic for many organisations to actually realise the importance of really identifying the inequalities in the in the sector and the service users that you might have. And certainly from a commission point of view, we have been really quite overwhelmed by the number of um, contacts that have been made with us and we've reached out to other organisations to actually give that advice as to how best to address these issues and really it does come back to that kind of business cases of why it's important and i know that you know lots lots of you within this field really struggle to get that message across to your leaders and when um i think um lucy mentioned about it's really important to get your leadership really in tuned and signed up to this because it is really important only from a you know ethical reason but actually for a business reason in in terms of the use of resources um, and preventing litigation. Um, but, you know, going back to that, it's just the right thing to do. Um, and I know that's really hard and can be difficult, but I think as Joe pointed out, if, if people can't see the reasons for that now, um, with the volume in the press and how it actually, you know, really connects to people individually, then I'm not sure what could be done for it, for people to not realize how important it is. Yeah, and, and to to emphasise what Anna is saying, we worked on presenting the business case of the PSED for quite some time. Indeed, we've got case studies on our website that talks about financial benefits, organisational benefits, individual benefits, etc. And I can see Michael Keating asking the same sort of question. Um, I think to me the message the message is quite clear. The PSED was not new. A lot of people were not doing them. Now we're in a context of crisis. And it's so important to do them because it costs life, it costs money, it will surely cost money. Um, in terms of organization, culture and moral, it will be damaging as well. So I, I think, if, if, as, as Anna said, if people can see the business, business case now, do that. Um, I, I'm not sure what will. And, and the other lesson for me is it's a thinking duty, but there are a requirement to take action or it's a logical inference. And indeed, we should move toward that. It's not about writing a document and having a process in place. It's about taking action. Thank you. Um, a number of questions have come in about how you achieve that buy-in. I think in, in the responses you've just given, panel, you've um, responded to some of that. But, but I think very much that um, vision that you gave us um, Lucy, around shifting from the idea that this is seen as a burden and shifting to it's absolutely about opportunity and change and change and improvement is something there's been a lot of interest in. Um, and we can all take that away and think about how we can further that in our own organisations. There have also been quite a few different questions and we don't have time to answer all of these about different um, um, protected characteristics. There have been quite a number around um, black and minority ethnic um, staff and service users, there's been a number of different questions about that. So let's take a couple of questions on that to finish. I think this probably was particularly thinking perhaps to you, Joe, and perhaps to you as well, Lucy, around was there any particular guidance that you created for your black and minority ethnic staff in through this crisis? And there's also a question for us in the Commission, Anna and Claire, about um, our response to Black Lives Matter in particular, and is there further guidance that we're thinking about in the context of that? There's been a number of other issues covered as well, mental health, etc. But let's take a, a little bit of time on um, Black minority ethnic staff, because we've all mentioned the particular impact that's had um, both on the workforce and, of course, on um, people in our communities. I go first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, we didn't create guidance; we stole it. <laughs> so, um, I think there's some really good guidance on um, risk assessment, you know, how to add risk assessment and um, have those conversations with your BAME staff uh, produced within the NHS. So, it's really from our NHS colleagues that, that we got a lot of guidance. Are there also some other risk assessments from some other councils? I think, oh, I can't remember the name, possibly. Surrey Council, I can't remember, sorry, but um, there was another county council that had developed some really good guidance. So it's just basically just going out there and 
and and picking picking the best really. Sure. <laughs> We did a similar thing in that we kind of uh, we looked at, at what other people had done and um, used that to develop our own risk assessments. But I would say the risk assessment is like the end point. So the, the thing that we have been doing much more of is much more engagement. We've got a race equality network in CQC and we've been doing much more engagement with the race equality network. We set up a new rapid action um, program around uh, around speeding up what we do in terms of staff employment we've also been using the race equality network um uh, not using the wrong word because they were really um keen to be involved in looking at what we do in, on in regulation around around ensuring that services are are safe and good quality for black and minority ethnic people and we've started four rapid projects to improve uh, our regulation specifically around race equality um, engaging with our race equality network. So it's been more, I, would, I wouldn't emphasize guidance as much as engagement. I mean, obviously guidance is really important for risk assessment, but as Joe said as well, it's about, it's about engaging with your staff on the range, of, the range of issues that they're facing and the range of things that they're motivated to change as citizens in terms of the services that you're providing as well. And get, but, but in a way that gives the, the black and minority ethnic staff involved also um, also development opportunities as employees, as well as using their knowledge as, um, as, as community members. So that's what we're working on. Thank you, Lucy. Come to the end of our time and I will have to stop us there. Um, two big take home messages for me, they're quite simplistic, but um, stealing is sometimes good, especially when it's about good practice. And I think the other you know, big message has come through uh, what the panelists have said and what people have reflected in their comments is if we don't get equality now, you know, we're, we're not going to. So let's take this opportunity to do that. We've come to the end of our session. Thank you to everybody that has um, attended online. Thank you very much to um, all of the speakers. I hope that has helped people just extend their knowledge and their learning. Um, Shan has been in touch. She does have contact details. So if you have further questions that you want to direct to us, we will do. We will be sharing the information. We will be asking for your feedback on this session. So there will be opportunity if there's something particular that you want to find out and that you didn't manage to today. We'll make sure that we get that to you one way or another. But thank you all for your time and take care. Thank you. <laughs>